Section one. First, you have some time to look at questions one through five. Now we begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, as the recording is not played twice. Listen carefully to the conversation, and answer questions one to five. School of Architecture, Professor Burt's office. Oh, good morning. I was wondering if you could give me some information about the forthcoming Architecture Twenty One conference.、Uh, dates, enrolment procedures, costs, that sort of thing. Uh huh. Well, the conference runs from the eighteenth to the twentieth of October. Eighteenth to the twentieth of October. Oh, good. I'll still be here then. And、um, where exactly is it being held? Is it at the university, as in previous years? No, it's actually being held at the Pacific Hotel. We've rather outgrown the university conference facilities, so we've opted for this new venue. Right, Paradise Hotel. No, the Pacific. That's P A C I F I C. Oh right, and presumably we can get accommodation at the hotel. Yes, but you'll need to contact them direct to arrange that. I'll give you the number for hotel reservations. Have you got a pen ready? Yes. Go ahead. It's area code zero seven, and then nine triple three double two double six. And what's the registration fee? Individual fees are three hundred dollars for the three days, or a hundred and twenty dollars a day if you only want to attend for one day. Are there any student concessions? There's a fifty percent concession for students, so that's a hundred and fifty dollars for the three days, or sixty dollars a day. And am I too late to offer to give a talk? Oh, I'm pretty sure you've missed the deadline for that. Oh, really? But I've only just arrived here in Australia. Is there any way I could have a paper accepted? Well, you'd need to talk to Professor Burt,、uh, the conference organizer. I can put you through if you like. That'd be great. Oh, and can I just check the spelling of his name? Is that B U R T? Yes, that's correct. You have some time to look at questions six to ten. Now listen carefully and answer questions six to ten. Professor Burt speaking. Oh, hello. My name's John Helston. I'm an architecture student at London University. I'm here in Australia for three months, looking at energy-saving house designs. Right. I'm interested in giving a talk on my research at the conference, but I believe I may have missed the deadline. Well, strictly speaking, you have. The closing date was last Friday. Oh no! But we may be able to include your paper if it fits into our program. But you'll have to be quick. Okay. What do I need to do? Send me a summary of your talk, and make sure you include an interesting title for the talk, something to attract people's attention. Okay. Interesting title. Right. I'm looking at ways of designing buildings for tropical climates that don't rely on the need to include air conditioning. So I'm sure I can come up with something. Yes, quite. But remember, the outline should be no more than three hundred words. Right. I'll try to keep it down to three hundred words. But would four hundred be okay? No, not really, because we have to print it in the proceedings, and we just don't have the space. Sure, I understand. And also, can you send me a short CV, the usual stuff—name, age, qualifications, that sort of thing? Right. Okay.、Uh, short CV. Actually, you can email it to me. That'd be quicker. Sure.、Uh, what's your email address? Well, the best thing would be to send it to the conference administrative officer at info—that's I N F O 
at uniconf.edu.au. Right. I'll do that straight away. That is the end of section one. Now turn to section two. Section two. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully to the short introductory talk and answer questions 11 to 15. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Apsley House. My name's Henry James, and I'm the proprietor of this, I must say, wonderful old house. My staff and I will do all that we can to ensure that your stay here at Apsley House is both informative and relaxing. If you look at the schedule I've prepared, you will see that we have planned a number of different activities for you. But what I'd like to do today is to introduce the house to you. So let's first deal with the history of the house. Apsley House is known as one of the finest houses in England. It was originally designed and constructed by the Scottish-born architect Robert Adam between the years 1771 and 1778, and from day one was the office of the Duke of Wellington. Back then it was a private house, but in 1987 it opened to the public for the first time. The Duke of Wellington was an avid collector of art, and if you look to the room to your left, can everyone see that all right? Yes? Good. You will see a rather large art gallery. The viewing gallery is 90 feet long and houses a wide range of art from all over Europe. Until recently, the gallery was closed to the public, but I'm pleased to say that it is now open and you are free to visit any time you wish. If you take a look at the schedule, you will see that I'll be talking to you about the gallery tomorrow after breakfast, so if you're interested in art, please be here by 9 o'clock for the talk. You now have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen to the rest of the short introductory talk and answer questions 16 to 20. This room here, to your right, is the cafeteria. Breakfast is served from 7.30 to 8.30 a.m., although you can request breakfast in your room if you prefer. The dining hall serves a traditional English breakfast, although vegetarian food is available on request. Just let the kitchen staff know the previous evening. Outside you will find a magnificent garden. A section of the garden was converted into a car park in 1990 to make way for the growing number of visitors. Nevertheless, much of it remains and is an ideal place for you to wander and enjoy the peace and quiet or simply sit and read. There are a lot of animals in the garden, including birds, squirrels, rabbits, oh, and not to forget Felix the cat. Now don't be alarmed if the animals come up to you. They are used to people and very friendly. Anyway, dinner will be served at 7, so in the meantime, please feel free to simply wander and enjoy the hospitality Apsley House has to offer. That is the end of Section 2. Now turn to Section 3. Section 3. You will hear a student called Jerry discussing a pedagogy course with his tutor. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 23. Now, listen carefully 
and answer questions 21 to 23. Jerry, how did it go with preparing your lessons? Is there anything you would like to discuss? Well, this is actually the first time that I have ever taught in an elementary classroom. After eight years of learning pedagogy, I want to practice what I've learned in an instructive manner. But I'm a bit stuck right now. You know the topic I want them to research is a bit hard for pupils. I'm afraid that they won't be able to handle it on their own. So I need new ideas on designing more effective teaching methods. Mr. Carter, do you have any suggestions? Well, you should probably read this book called Professional Learning, written by J.K. Simmons. He is a professor who just transferred here last semester, but is already popular amongst the students for his creative teaching methods. There is an extensive range of learning approaches mentioned in the book, including approaches for team research, which might be helpful to you. You mean dividing the students into groups to do research? I've never thought of this before. How does it work? Professor Simmons has already demonstrated how efficient this approach can be. Basically, it aims to increase cooperation between students so they can present the results in a collaborative fashion. It helps them to develop their own voice and perspective. I'll check out the book as soon as possible. It seems I can borrow some of the essential concepts and work them into my course design. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 24 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 24 to 30. Well, I was thinking maybe I could use both observation and non-observation as a part of my teaching methodology. Could you take a look at my teaching plan? Sure. What kind of observational methods do you have in mind? For the observational part, I intend to include two approaches. First, the pupils can assess each other's behaviour. I feel that reviewing fellow students through criteria-based reference evaluation allows constructive feedback. It can also improve their understanding of the subject material. That's a smart move for a large class that would be hard to observe all by yourself. Also, you might want to get the feedback from several different individuals rather than just one. So how do you plan to carry out the peer assessments? Oh, every pupil will be required to write a diary, which includes group projects, presentations and in-class discussions. They'll put down their remarks. I'll collect them on a regular basis, which can also help me see whether they can keep up or not. Good. What else do you intend to do? Besides that, I also plan to do video recording. I've already purchased a camera, just in case I miss anything important. I can go back and review their performances any time I want. Would you record every in-class activity? No, I'll just keep track of an in-class simulation, which would require every pupil to fully participate. Students will act as members of a city council meeting, discussing issues like whether or not prohibition should be instated in the United States. This kind of teaching method is both inspiring and challenging. I can't wait to see how yours works out. Do send me a copy of the assessment afterwards, will you? No problem. So, what do you have in mind for the non-observational approaches? Well, my plan is to quantify the statistics. Numbers do not lie. It is the most direct way to measure their performance. See how well they've learned. Where does the data come from? I'll evaluate the test results, including the midterm, final exam and pop quizzes, which would only take up about 40% of the overall assessment. Sounds like a lot of tests and assignments. Please remember that you don't want to wear out your students. Keeping them engaged is the key to efficient learning. 
Once they are exhausted, they just stop trying. Oh, I haven't thought about that. You are right. I don't want to frighten them with tons of assignments and exams. I'll make note of that. Thanks for the advice. I remember last time you mentioned questionnaires, right? That's true, but it is not for my students. In fact, they have to design their own questionnaires and choose the respondents using the internet. As a complement of other teaching activities, it would deepen the creative learning process. Is that all? Oh, the pupils will have to conduct interviews of their own, and for this, they get to choose anyone they like. Including relatives, friends, and acquaintances to answer the questions. Seems to me that you have figured out most of your teaching methods, but you still need to polish some of the activities. That is the end of section three. To section four. Section four. You will hear part of a lecture about urban migration. First. You have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now, listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Good afternoon, and welcome to my talk on urban migration today. The world has experienced unprecedented urban growth in the recent decade. As much as three percent of Earth's landmass has been urbanized, an increase of at least fifty percent over previous estimates. Today. People living in cities already outnumber those in rural areas, and the trend does not appear to be reversing. In addition, cities have larger amounts of carbon consumption than rural areas. This is a result from two major aspects. First, with the increase of urban population around the world, the massive construction of urban infrastructure and residential housing is hard to avoid. Second. Urban households have a higher rate of car ownership, and use more gasoline products. Even though rural exodus is often negatively judged, there are also benefits of migration shared by the local environment and the society as a whole. Well, firstly, global trends of increasing urban migration and population urbanization can provide opportunities. For nature conservations, particularly in regions where deforestation is driven by agriculture, as rural dwellers leave their homes, local forests are left to recover. What's more, it is easier for city dwellers to get around. Living in the country means transport can be very difficult. For instance, after midnight, there are no buses or taxis in the countryside. However, there is still a number of public transport modes to choose from in the city. Finally, with more funds and advanced technology, cities endeavour to produce clean energy. New power plants have been built to take harmful methane gas created by the decomposition of rubbish and convert it into electricity. By doing so, an important greenhouse gas is turned into useful energy. Rather than being directly emitted into the atmosphere, the hustle and bustle of city life offers women the opportunity to explore different professions and pursue their own careers. Women in cities work as engineers, managers, and even football players. This change of roles has affected their marital status and family life. More women are choosing their careers over marriage. Which raises the graph of late marriages. As a result, more are remaining single, well into their late thirties. They want to be independent and earn money on their own. 
It is also easier for them to get a promotion while working in the city. Women are slowly achieving wider participation at work, while in rural areas the mindset is still very conservative. However, cities also change the way that humans interact with each other and the environment, often causing multiple problems. In general, urban wages are significantly higher, so moving to the city is an opportunity to earn what was impossible in rural areas. However, the wage difference is often offset by the higher cost of living and absence of self-produced goods, including substance farming. A sizable proportion of new corners attach greater importance to money and gradually abandon their former way of life, thus risking losing their culture. These new city residents are also faced with another problem. According to statistics, crime rates are significantly higher in densely populated urban regions than in rural areas. For instance, Property crime rates in our metropolitan areas are three to four times as high in comparison to the rates in rural communities. Immigrants, upon arrival into cities, typically move into the poor, blighted neighborhoods because that is where they can afford to live. Crime in these areas is high and reflects poor living conditions, as these neighborhoods experience great levels of poverty. This pattern also occurs for violent crimes, which is much more common in large urban areas than elsewhere. In addition, traffic congestion and industrial manufacturing are prominent features of the urban landscape, which take their toll on the natural environment and those who depend on it. Air pollution from both cars and factory emissions affect the health of countless urban residents. Rural to urban migration can boost the urban economy. With a better economy, cities provide their residents with better welfare. But the concentration of services and facilities, such as education, health and technology in urban areas, inevitably contributes to greater energy consumption. Another problem with life in the city is traffic congestion. It makes people late to work and thus stresses us out before we even get there. Deliveries can't arrive on time, gas costs money. The quality of life of those commuters starts to decline. What's worse is that if congestion makes it harder to match the right workers to the best jobs, it is economically inefficient as well. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Oh, 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 oh,